from the palatial recording studios of the Corbett Report in Western Japan, it's the second annual Real Fake News Awards. Featuring the biggest stinkers, clunkers, and downright fake stories propounded by the lying liars of the mainstream media in the past year. Last year's awards saw the shame-inducing dinos going to CNN, The New York Times, National Geographic, and others, with the top prize going to The Guardian for their fake reporting on Syria. Will The Guardian retain its spot this year, or will another figure come along to take its place as biggest purveyor of fake news? We'll find out in a moment, but first, a word from our corporate sponsors. Johnson & Johnson's Baby Powder. As best as free since 2003. Honest. And... Pepsi! We control the World Bank now, suckers! And now, tonight's host, James Corbett! Uh, thank you. <laughs> oh, thank you. Thank you, one and all. Oh, you're too kind. Really, you're too kind. Oh, well, welcome to tonight's festivities. As you just heard, I am James Corbett. This is The Corbett Report, specifically episode 351 of The Corbett Report podcast, the second annual Real Fake News Awards. I'll be your host for this evening as we take a tiptoe through the tulips of disinformation, misinformation, and downright fake news that has been spread like manure through the pastures of the mainstream media over the past year, and we will sift through the very, very worst of it, nose plugs firmly in place, to examine and ultimately laugh at the ridiculous fake news stinkers that the mainstream media managed to dredge up over the previous year. So, for those of you who are unfamiliar with the concept of the real fake news awards and what they are and where they came from, I will direct you back to last year's edition of this award ceremony, episode 329 of the Corporate Report podcast. The link to that and everything that we mention here will be in the show notes for this episode of the podcast at CorbettReport.com. Please go there and... While you're there, you might as well take a look at the announcement for this award ceremony, where I put out the call for people to submit their nominations for the fake news stories of the year. And boy, did the Corporate Report members heed that call. Dozens and dozens and dozens of comments and lively conversation about the fake news, the worst fake news of 2018. Lots of submissions were made. And on that note, I'd like to draw special attention and give a special thank you to uh, Corbett Report member Stevo, who directed my attention to an article that I hadn't seen, a news story that must have escaped my attention late last year, in October specifically, when The Telegraph released this government bans phrase fake news. That's right. Apparently the UK government has banned the term fake news after urging ministers to use misinformation or disinformation instead. The phrase, a favorite of U.S. President Donald Trump, will no longer appear in policy documents or official papers because it is a poorly defined and misleading term that conflates a variety of false information from genuine error through to foreign interference in democratic processes, officials said. While ministers may speak freely in the House of Commons, any strategy documents referring to election meddling or internet safety will need to use the new definition. <laughs> Winning! Hashtag winning! That's that's it in a nutshell right there. Oh, that's so beautiful to see how the weaponized term that was meant to be directed against all of us in the pu general public, the people who are engaging in free discourse and freely interacting with each other on the internet, oh, suddenly, oh, the big fake news scare, and oh, people are trying to decide things for themselves. Oh, no, we need gatekeepers. Quick, let's weaponize the term fake news. And immediately upon doing so, that term was wielded back against the establishment and used against them. <laughs> so now they have to abandon it. Oh, no, they're using the term against us. What will we do? Run away, run away. Uh, that is an example of how whenever there is a f even a somewhat fair playing field or so, uh, usually a rigged playing field, but we still have a foot in the door. The people will still gen generally set the agenda and will be able, and truth will be able to knock through the barricade of lies that are set before us. Or should I say the barricade of misinformation and disinformation put out by the mainstream news. Oh, sorry that that weaponized fake news term didn't work out for you. Better luck next time, guys. <laughs> so that is a great story. It's a sign that we are winning and the the fake news 
agenda that was clearly put in place a couple of years ago to try to weaponize that term and turn it against anyone trying to spread information on the internet has very much backfired in the establishment's face. Thank you for that, Stevo. You and every other single commenter that I single out here tonight will be receiving a Corbett Report DVD of your choosing. I'll be in touch with you shortly via email to arrange the details on that. So thank you for that. Um, let's move straight into the awards. And as I say, you should go to the announcement for this award ceremony so that you can take a look through the comment section and look at the many, many, many stories that were suggested as fake news stories for 2018. Of course, I can't possibly highlight or go through them all in any degree of detail, but I will direct your attention there so you can go and take a look at some of those uh, stories that were suggested there. Uh, overall, as I say, dozens and dozens of different comments. But I think if there was a one clear winner for fake news story of the year in terms of just the number of people suggesting it, it was the Russian meddling, Russian influence, Russian boogeyman, Russian scare stories of the past year. This is not necessarily a new uh, trend. Uh, it's one that's been going on for obviously a few years now, but it certainly did not flag in 2018 in any way. In fact, if anything, the fakery of the, all of these Russian uh, scare stories only intensified over the past year. So I certainly understand why so many people were suggesting this as a general trend, but this is the fake news awards for specific fake stories rather than general trends. So I want to hone in on one specific story in the overall Russian boogeyman scare stories that I thought was particularly important and was pointed out by a number of different commenters. But chronologically, the first commenter to point it out was Clint Torres. So I will, again, be in touch with Clint Torres to arrange delivery of the Corbett Report DVD of his choosing. But this year's Fake Russian Hysteria of the Year Award goes to... The British mainstream media for the Screeple story. Oh, yes, you know the Screeple story by now. The dreaded Novichok poisoning. Oh, Novichok. I mean, it, it's Russian. It sounds Russian. It's... Oh, it, how could this not be the Russians? Well, if uh, you did not catch this story, I will humbly suggest that you go and check out The Russian Poison Story is WMD 2.0, an article that I wrote on the subject shortly after it began to break in the mainstream media back in March. And the short synopsis of the story that I gave in that article... Quote, for those not in the know, the case revolves around Sergei Skripal, who the media disingenuously refers to as a former Russian spy. In this case, former Russian spy is a euphemism for ongoing MI6 double agent. <laughs> or, more accurately, recently poisoned MI6 double agent. That's because Skripal and his daughter were admitted to hospital after passing out on a shopping center bench in Salisbury, England, earlier this month. They remain in critical condition. Or maybe they're already dead. Who knows? <laughs> there is a link there for people interested in exploring that. Anyway, naturally, in this era of Russiagate hysteria, it took precisely no time at all before the UK government began intimating it was the Russians. And despite not providing a shred of evidence for that claim, the Mockingbird media naturally followed along. Of course, the Russians did it, we are told by the MSM repeaters. Evidence, schmevidence. I mean, come on, poisoning, Soviet Union, Russians. Do we have to draw you a map? End quote. Well, that was the uh, summary of the story as it stood there in mid-March, but obviously it did not die in mid-March, neither did the Screeples, <laughs> but that's another story. Uh, uh, the story continued to unfold. It was one hell of a story in terms of perpetuating the Russian boogeyman and continued to float to the top of the turd bowl again and again and again, throughout the year, as different facts were dribbled out. And I use the term facts loosely there because we are talking about the mainstream media. Now, I cannot do justice to all of the crazy twists and turns and debunkings and, and silliness that has surrounded this story over the many, many months that it has been playing out now. But for that, I will direct your attention uh, specifically to the blog of Craig Murray, who you will know as the former, uh, former UK ambassador, who has been blogging quite at length about this subject uh, for basically since the story broke on craigmurray.org.uk. 
Uh, and he goes through so many of the crazy things surrounding this story, including, of course, the BBC reporter who was in touch with and communicating with the Screeples in the month, or at least uh, uh, Screeple Sr., the father, over the months uh, prior to the poisoning that he didn't let on, didn't reveal to anyone in the public until several months later he came out with a book, the expose, expose tell-all book, the inside story of the Screeples. How do I know? Because I was secretly in touch with them and communicating with them. How was he secretly in touch with them? Oh, he just happened to have been in the tank regiment of the Screeples MI6 handler back in the day. But, well, you know, whatever, hand wave, we, we don't talk about that. The Freedom of Information request that was uh, forwarded to try to get more information about that, the BBC hiding behind their journalistic shield, we don't give information about the, anything that our reporters do or what information they're withholding from the public. Uh, again, crazy twists and turns, the very latest of which I will also direct your attention to. The Screeple story just got weirder. First responder revealed as chief army nurse. Steel Link blamed on Russia. Again, just more craziness coming out of this story. The story that keeps on giving for the propaganda pushers, because at the very least, they have, I think, in the minds of the fluoride-addled MSM zombie addicts, uh, associated the terms Novichok and Skripal and Russia and Putin and evil, just kind of all in this big melange. And hey, here you go. So anytime they talk about the Skripals, oh, new new twist in the Skripal case, here you go. And it re-triggers the memory in the minds of the people who credulously follow what the MSM reports. But as I say, Every single piece of this has been debunked many, many times over. Um, again, Craig Murray getting into the details of the CCTV cameras that didn't catch anyone, or that didn't catch uh, the, the, the suspected Russian agents uh, uh, doing anything with the doorknob. Or, uh, and then there was the perfume. Uh, it just keeps going on and on. So I will leave it to you to get into that, all of the details of that. It is an incredible story. But it certainly ranks up there as... The shining example of the Russian, Russian meddling, Russian spies, Russian poisoning, Russia, Russia, Russia stories of the year. So I think that uh, that is a great suggestion. Uh, thank you to everyone who put that into the hat for this year's awards. And uh, the, well, uh, let's not thank the British mainstream media for credulously reporting every morsel that they receive from the people over at Porton Down. What's Porton Down again? Oh, it's the bastion of uh, Wikipedia, uh, truthiness, and Wikipedia will tell you. Oh, it's it's a, a science park. <laughs> By which we mean a secret bioweapons lab that houses, houses anthrax and Ebola and probably Novichok. Anyway, uh, moving right along. <laughs> again, you can't make this stuff up. But the MSM certainly tries. Uh, let's move on to the next award. And this one... Uh, it harkens back to a theme that will probably be in every single edition of this award ceremony. And last year, it was taken up by that story about the starving polar bear because of climate change that, as I noted at the time in the fake news awards last year, and as I followed up with further confirmation, when ultimately all the players involved had to say, yeah, okay, this wasn't about climate change. <laughs> that was a complete scare story that was made up fake news. Well, this year... We have the Fake Climate Scare of the Year Award going to Nature for Quantification of Ocean Heat Uptake from Changes in Atmospheric O2 and CO2 Composition. Now, that headline may not resonate for you, but it was the study that launched a thousand scaremongering headlines across the mainstream lying fake news media. Like CNN, of course, world's oceans have absorbed 60% more heat than previously thought, study finds, or the Washington Post, which dutifully reported on the subject, startling new research finds large buildup of heat in the oceans, suggesting a faster rate of global warming, or Scientific American reproducing a report from e, e News, the oceans are heating up faster than expected. The planet may be more sensitive to warming than previously thought, making climate goals more difficult to meet. Just one little problem about this study that, you know, a few weeks later, after the scaremongering headlines had had their chance to make the rounds and scare people once again with their, their climate angst, BBC News even admitted, in a quiet, 
update to the story a few weeks later. Oh, climate change, colon, concerns over report on ocean heating. Not exactly a, a grabbing headline, is it? It doesn't quite, doesn't quite grab you in the same way that the other headlines tended to grab you. And why is that? It's because, oh, errors have been found in a recent study suggesting the oceans were soaking up more heat than previously estimated. The initial report suggested that the seas have absorbed 60% more than previously thought, but a re-examination by a mathematician showed that the margin of error was larger than in the published study. The authors have acknowledged the problem and have submitted a cor correction to the journal. <laughs> yes, uh, uh, this is another story where, again, just scraping the surface of this scaremongering headline, you start to see how unbelievably, laughably shoddy this work is, and again, how utterly credulous every single editor, every single peer reviewer, every single person in the media who dutifully reported on this study was in not bothering to do a simple bit of arithmetic that immediately showed that the study was total nonsense. <laughs> to get the real story on what this study didn't show and why it didn't show it, you have to go to Climate Etc., the blog of PreviousCorbettReport.com guest Judith Curry, who published a post by Nick Lewis on the 6th of November 2018, almost three weeks before the or uh, before the, the BBC decided to report on this correction, but he, he noticed a little problem on uh, buried in the back of this paper, somewhere in one of the footnotes, somewhere in the marginalia, or underneath one of the charts, or something that was slightly... No, a glaring mathematical problem on page one <laughs> of the paper. Quoting from Nick Lewis's post... A quick bit of mental arithmetic indicated that a change of 23.2 between 1991 and 2016 represented an annual rate of approximately 0 0.9, well below their 1.16 value. As that seemed surprising, I extracted the annual, uh, annual Delta APO best estimate values and uncertainties from the paper's extended data table and computed the 1991 to 2016 least squares linear fit trend in the Delta APO climate values. The trend was 0 0.88, not 1.16 per meg per year, implying an ocean heat uptake estimate of 10.1 zettajoules per year, well below the estimate in the paper of 13.3. Zettajoules per year. Dot dot dot. What does this actually mean in English? It means that the scaremongering headlines, oceans trapping 60% more heat than we thought. It, oh, it's so much worse. Uh, climate Armageddon is right around the corner. Guy. Oh, wait, no, sorry. Sorry, none of that was true. Oh, oops, we made a little made a little calculation error on page one that kind of affected the entire conclusion of the study. Oops. Oopsie. Well, at least it was a error in the right direction to be alarming enough to get published and promoted universally and unquestioningly throughout the media. Not a single reviewer noticed this glaring mistake. Nick Lewis came along after the study was published. As he said, he was alerted to this, uh, this study by other people who asked him to take a look at it. And he's looking at it, just glancing at page one, he thought it was surprising <laughs> that here you have a change of 23.2 between 1991 and 2016. Just, you know, not doing the least squares linear fit trend, just doing a bit of mental arithmetic. You're going to be pretty surprising that that trend would be over one, <laughs> don't you think? <laughs> and as it turns out, yes, they did the, the math wrong. Again, this is the way the climate scare works. As long as your mistakes are in the right direction to make it alarming enough, it will be reported absolutely credulously. Here it is, guys. Here's the truth. It's worse than we thought. Oh, wait, it isn't worse than we thought? Okay, we'll bury that. And at the very least, at least this time, Nick Lewis points this out and eventually they submit a correction and uh, the paper gets retracted. Oh, wait, no, the paper didn't get retracted. It's still up on Nature and you can go there and, you know, at the first page you're going to see the... The, the, uh, the abstract for the paper, and then you're going to see the data availability and additional information, and then you'll see the change history. Change history. 19th of November 2018. Editor's note. We'd like to alert readers that the authors have informed us of errors 
in the paper. The authors have informed us of errors in the paper. I thought that was your job as as reviewers and as the, one of the most prestigious publications in the scientific world. Don't, don't, don't you kind of check these things before you publish them? An implication of the errors is that the ins- uncertainties in ocean heat content are su- substantially underestimated. <laughs> we are working with the authors to establish the quantitative impact of the errors on the published results, at which point in time we will provide a further update. And just for the record, there is no further update on this page anyway. If they did ever publish a further update, I don't know where they did. It's certainly not here and not in any place where you're likely to see it unless you're scrolling down into the paper or at least into the the front page, the public page for the citation. Uh, This is the way it works. And this is why the alarmism keeps getting more and more amped up And the voices of reason, who actually can do math, (laughs) continue to have to pick away at the edges of this massive nonsense that they're throwing at the wall. So that is the climate scare story of the year. Uh, There were several people in the comment section that were pointing out the idea of uh, the the IPCC's special report on global warming of 1.5 degrees Celsius as the scare story, the climate scare story of the year. And I, I suppose that is right in a sense, but... Really, the IPCC is just a compilation of all of these little errors and and things that go along. And this was a specific story that we could point to. Here is 100% mathematically wrong information that is being published as science and promoted as a scare story in the fake news media. So that was something we could put our finger on. So I wanted to definitely point out that story for people who missed it. All right, we're going to move on to our next contestant or our next award in this uh, a gallery, this rogues gallery of fake news uh, purveyors. And this award is the Fake Pentagon Budget Story of the Year. And the award goes to the New York Times for the misleading claim that $21 trillion in misspent Pentagon funds could pay for Medicare for All. Now, this is an interesting take on the recent revelation that the missing trillions that I've been talking about for many years here on The Corbett Report and following the development of this information as it continues to be trickled out through uh, through uh, Office of Inspector General reports here and there, has now amassed into $21 trillion of unaccounted transactions over the past couple of decades as the Pentagon once again, fails to produce a budget, even though they have been mandated by law to produce one for going on two decades now. Oopsie. Oh, but we get get bonus marks for trying, or so says the Pentagon. Well, here the New York Times is labeling it misleading that the Pentagon has actually lost or misplaced or misspent $21 trillion dollars. And so the angle that they're taking here is, uh, of course, Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez and apparently a tweet that she made about this story. Representative-elect Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez, the New York Democrat who has become a darling of the progressive left, was quoting from an article in The Nation about massive accounting fraud committed by the Pentagon from 98 to 2015. But her suggestion that the $21 trillion in military transactions could have already paid two-thirds the cost of a Medicare for All healthcare system goes beyond what the article reported and is misleading. Oh, why? Please tell us, New York Times. Well, for starters, the combined Pentagon budget from 98 to 2015 was $9.2 trillion. One study by a libertarian economic think tank found that Medicare for All legislation by Senator Bernie Sanders, independent of Vermont, would cost the federal government $32.6 trillion over 10 years. So where did the $21 trillion figure originate? It comes from an analysis of the Pentagon's unsupported journal voucher adjustments by Mark Skidmore, an economist at Michigan State University. The term refers to improperly documented accounting adjustments that are made when different financial ledgers do not match. In other words... $21 $21 trillion is the total value of adjustments made to the Pentagon's financial records over those years that could not be traced. That is not the same thing as $21 trillion in spending. And they go on from there, quoting the Pentagon Comptroller, David Norquist, and his testimony explaining what this all means, etc., etc. Well, this will not be a news story to viewers of The Corporate Report, because you will already be well familiar with this story from a number of angles, including from Dr. Mark Skidmore himself. 
to whom I did put this question. Well, does this really mean, is this really 21 trillion? Can it actually be 21 trillion? And yeah, no, it not only can it be 21 trillion that has been misplaced or gone through the system somehow, it could be very much more than that. We don't know. Don't take it from me. Take it from the professor who examined this himself. My initial thought would be that, f for example, if there are these entries, $800 billion from the treasury, uh, you know, received, then if that is, if we are to take that, is, is it, this is possibly actual funds that were received from the treasury. If, if that were true, wouldn't that be reflected somewhere in the treasury's books? Wouldn't we see this from another angle somewhere? Uh, wouldn't that give credence to the idea, well, this is just made up nonsense that they're plugging into the books? Wouldn't there be some other way at, at seeing yeah. if this is real money? James, none of this makes any sense. So, you know, uh, Dave Lindor's conclusion was you know, in the Nation article is that these uh, unsupported transactions, transactions that we can't account for, are done purposefully by the DOD in order to obfuscate and and so it's so vague and unclear nobody asks any questions and they're able to negotiate for increased spending amounts every year that's his conclusion and i i don't agree with that conclusion i don't know how you could possibly conclude that if if treasury doesn't respond to a question about well was this an actual transfer then treasury did, how do you know that that wasn't a real transaction that occurred that money actually flowed in in some way i don't know um, similarly, if the OIG doesn't provide any information about these 170 adjustments, why would the Army make those numbers up, right? Or how could it be that these, um, they're just erroneous transactions, you know, um, that there's system problems in those huge amounts, just 170 transactions worth $2.1 trillion. Um, so the, the, you know, the DOD's explanations of, well, we don't have, we have inadequate systems and we're basically incompetent, we can't fix it over two decades, does not make sense to me. But it doesn't make sense to me that, well, they do this on purpose to obfuscate so that they can somehow negotiate for more funding. You know, to me, that would work in the opposite direction. If I were a lawmaker, I would say, get your books fixed and then we'll talk about what you need. Um, but that never seems to happen. And so then the other alternative is the one that Catherine, based on her experience in HUD, has emphasized. It's like, this could really be trillions of dollars flowing in and out for who knows what purpose. Now, as I'm sure you can appreciate, even from that clip alone, this is a much bigger story than uh, any soundbite or any fact check from the New York Times is ever going to be able to provide you. So I would suggest you would start tipping, dipping your toe into these waters by going and taking a look at that full interview that I did with Dr. Mark Skidmore last month. Of course, it will be in the show notes. It is at CorbettReport.com. But uh, once you have done that and are interested in the story, might I suggest that you also go to MissingMoney.Solari.com, where Dr. Skidmore and Catherine Austin Fitz have been compiling and archiving this information from these various reports, an important step because the Pentagon has a habit of changing links here and there and making things increasingly difficult to find. Maybe something will kind of go away and oh, researchers will have to try to find it again. All of the information is documented and easily available at missingmoney.solari.com. They even have a nice list where you can see what page number of which report says how many trillions cannot be accounted in this line item of this year's budget. It's a very handy resource. And of course, also Dr. Skidmore and Catherine Oster Fitz have been writing uh, reports about this that um, have really been doing the work that has gotten at least some MSM attention to this issue. Uh, enough for it for, uh, to make a New York Times fact check. Of course, the New York Times comes out on the wrong side of that fact check, as always, but we would expect that, wouldn't we? And, uh, well, anyway, there is a lot more information uh, out there. And, hey, bonus point, side note, at least Rolling Stone and Matt, Matt Taibbi finally came out this just a couple of days ago with a report detailing what, again, Dr. Skidmore talked about in our interview last month, namely that back in October, there was a federal accounting guideline that was issued saying, yes, it's 100% okay for the federal government to cook the books. Any federal agency can now lie directly to the public, lie about their budget, move numbers here, fudge numbers there, anything they need to do in the interest of 
national security, of course. And uh, so, yes, now the government is now openly acknowledging that it is now legally lying to you, lying to you about its budgets. <laughs> but uh, basically staring the public in the face and saying, what are you going to do about it? And, well, so far, nothing, uh, uh, interestingly. But at least Rolling Stone and Matt Taibbi finally caught up to that story. Welcome to uh, 2018, Matt. Uh, maybe now you'll catch up to 9-11 Truth. No, I wouldn't expect that. Anyway, thank you to Ardian, who was the one who initially suggested this story. There were a few people talking about the $21 trillion story, uh, but it was Ardian, I think, was the first chronologically to suggest it, so I will be in touch with you about that free Corbett Report DVD. Let's move on to the next award. The next award is Fake Death of the Year Award, and it goes to CNN for... Russian journalist Babchenko, critic of Kremlin, shot dead in Ukraine. <laughs> yes, for those of you who didn't catch this story, it is a doozy, and it even provides you with a little formula about how to fake your own death. You know, I mean, you need a little bit of pig's blood, you need a nice staged photo with a t-shirt with some uh, bullet holes shot in it, and uh, something else, something else. Oh, that's right, the help of an intelligence agency. Uh, in this case, the Ukrainian intelligence services were involved in this staged fake death that CNN and, to be fair, many other outlets reported on credulously once again. Oh, uh, oh, wow, there's been a death. Oh, you know who it was behind it? It was Putin. Putin must have killed this guy. Putin did it. Oh, wait. Oh, wait. He's... Pabjinko is holding a press conference now and... He's alive. What's going on? Oh, he staged his own death. Okay, let's sweep that under the cover and never speak about it again. <laughs> yes, uh, you might have missed this story because, of course, it was swept under the cover. For those who did, I will humbly suggest you go to my wittily and uh, originally entitled article, How to Fake Your Own Death, where I do summarize it thusly. Arkady Babchenko is the so-called journalist who recently faked his own death in order to prove that the Russians are trying to kill him or something like that. And if everything had gone according to plan, you can bet your bottom dollar that you would know his name by now. Babchenko would be a rallying cry for Russiagate tinfoil hatters of all stripes, having been plastered all over the front page of the newspapers, endlessly discussed on the 24-7 cable news networks, and tweeted ad nauseum by the Twitterati. It would be deployed as a one-word rejoinder to anyone who dares question the neo-neocons and their neo-Cold War propaganda crusade against the neo-Russian threat. But everything did not go according to plan. You see, the Vlad the Impaler just assassinated another journalist panic party came to an abrupt and awkward end when Babchenko turned up very much alive and well at a press conference to explain that, in fact, he wasn't dead exactly. But he would be if the Russians got their way or... Something like that. <laughs> okay, we'll leave it there. I do suggest you go and read through the story if you are unfamiliar with it. It is a doozy. It really is. This is, in some ways, the epitome of fake news. This is a shining example, and no, no surprise at all that it was swept under the rug so quickly and everyone has forgotten about it because the MSM doesn't like you to remember stories like this that shows just how easy it is for intelligence services to play the mighty Wurlitzer, as it's been called, i.e. the credulous MSM, of course the establishment lapdogs, that will report anything that they are told by any authority and any intelligence agency, in this case the Ukrainian intelligence service, which helped Babchenko stage his own death. It is shameful, it is disgusting, just how easy it was to trick basically every outlet in the world into going along with it until they held a press conference with the supposedly dead man who was very much alive. Oh, oops, did we report that? Never mind, let's move on. As I say, this is the epitome of fake news. This is how easy it is for the entire MSM establishment to be shunted into a certain line of thinking. The only difference with this story and some of the other stories is that this one they came out and admitted, oh yeah, it was all a hoax, it was a fake. Don't worry, guys. But but trust the trust CNN and, and the other MSM bulldogs, the the you know the fourth estate, the ones that will hold power to account. Trust them on every other issue. But you know, in this case, yeah, they kind of reported something that was 180 degrees opposite to reality. Uh, but you know, 
don't don't think about that. Don't think about the implications of a story like that. Well, we have to think about the implications of a story like that, which is exactly why the real fake news awards exist. So you'll have to own that dishonor, dishonor CNN, although to be fair, you share that dishonor with many, many of your MSN brethren for uh, breathlessly reporting the headlines about the assassinated journalist. Assassinated at the hands of Putin, no doubt, right? All right, well, let's move on to a, uh, well, a very similar story. This year, uh, we're going to give a Fake Reporter of the Year Award to Der Spiegel and Klaus Relochius for his award-winning fake news. The list of things that this reporter made up and pawned off on his, once again, very credulous editors is almost as unbelievable as the awards that he won for that fake reporting, including the European Press Prize and the Deutsche Reporter Prize in 2013, 2015, 2016, and 2018, and, drumroll please, CNN's Journalist of the Year. <laughs> you can't make this stuff up, but you very much uh, can apparently win awards for making this stuff up. Uh, at least that's how Klaus and Der Spiegel roll. Although it wasn't just for Der Spiegel. He published many fake reports over the years. Uh, this time the hat tip is going to go to Maelia, who suggested this story and who provided some of the details uh, from the... From, for example, German Handelsblatt about what his fake reporting entailed. For example, the story about a Syrian boy who believed he triggered the civil war in the country with his graffiti, which was completely made up. An article that won the German Reporter Prize just three weeks ago, but which was fake. And uh, one article, very probably forged as well, which one can still look up at Der Spiegel, is called A Syrian Family's Quest to, to Become German. Uh, there were many such similar uh, fables, uh, and even, unbelievably, he was accepting donations on the behalf of Syrian orphans that he had claimed to meet in Turkey, but who didn't exist, were totally made up. He was accepting those donations into his personal bank account, however. Unbelievable. Unbelievable, quite literally, but there it is. And this is how it rolls, guys. Once again, as long as you're putting out the right stories that fit the right agenda, you will win the awards, no matter how much of your story you make up. And in this case, it seems he made an awful lot of it up. Which kind of gets you thinking about the editorial standards at outlets like Der Spiegel, doesn't it? Again, wouldn't you think... All these reviewers and editors, I mean, there's got to be some kind of fail-safe, some kind of mechanism that'll come into play when a reporter, oh, I don't know, completely makes up interviewees and subjects of his reports. You'd think someone might pick up on that, wouldn't you? No. No, they don't. And once again, <laughs> it's, it's really incredible just how blatant all of these fake news stories are in this era of fake news. So now that we have the term for it, the weaponized term that has been turned against them, they can't avoid it because they have to look squarely in the face of all this fake news that has come out. Well, it is time. It is that time. We've covered a number of stories here. There are many, many, many more examples of fake news from 2018 that we could go over, but it is time to unveil the fake news story of the year. It is that moment. But... Before we do so, everyone, I was going to order pizza for y'all, but, oh, I thought, well, the next best thing might be vaccinations. Hey, everybody, let's get your flu shots. Hey, just roll up your sleeve. Don't worry. These are trained medical professionals. There will be no problems taking the vaccine. Don't look disturbed at what's happening. And uh, if you are one of those <laughs> crazy anti-vaxxers, just put a napkin on your head. Am I right? <laughs> oh. Wow, this is so fun! Woo! Awards! Yay! Okay. <clears throat> All right, now let's go on. Fake Story of the Year Award goes to... Donald Trump for many dead, including women and children, in mindless chemical attack in Syria. 
area of atrocity is in lockdown and encircled by Syrian army, making it completely inaccessible to outside world. President Putin, Russia, and Iran are responsible for backing animal Assad. Big price. Dot, dot, dot. Last Saturday, the Assad regime again deployed chemical weapons to slaughter innocent civilians, this time in the town of Doma, near the Syrian capital of Damascus. That's right, the dissembler-in-chief went right along with the Syria chemical attack narrative, walk step with all of the neocons that he appointed to his administration. Funny how that works, isn't it? And immediately blamed animal Assad as well as Russia and, hey, Iran too, let's throw them all in for the vicious, heartless chemical attack that obviously took place in Duma in Syria. And for the second year in a row, we have... Fake news from Syria leading the way as fake news story of the year. Now, of course, in the immediate wake of whatever took place in Duma, we did have the Syria chemical weapons attack, an open source investigation for Corbett Report members, and there were many contributions to that thread, 330 of them to be precise. So a lot of discussion taking place, people parsing through the information as it was coming in, but it seemed quite apparent from very early on that this was another in a long line of staged false flag chemical provocations of various sorts that we've gone through time and time again. Perhaps most recently from that point in 2017, at around the same time of year, when once again the U.S. was starting to talk about, well, maybe it's time to bring Assad to the table and there's a political solution. Well, there was a chemical attack as soon as they started talking that way. And then 2018 in April, once again, just as they're starting to talk about it, oh, there's another chemical attack. And again, we have to launch another series of missile strikes against Syria, which was ka-ching, ka-ching, good fake news for the military contractors who got to see 110 of their little baby instruments of death and destruction rain down on Syria to the tune of however many tens of millions of dollars that that cost the U.S. to, and their partners, there were others involved in those strikes, to replenish their supplies, as is the case with all of these excuses to use old inventory and buy new inventory, as the Syria strikes of 2017 were before them. And it accomplished so much, didn't it? to immediately talk about venomous President Putin, Russia, and Iran backing animal Assad, big price to pay. Except, oh, a couple of niggly, wiggly details, like, oh, how the OPCW uh, issued an interim report in June, of course, a couple of months later, of course, after the strikes took place, after this had any political relevance whatsoever, but after the inspectors had the chance to inspect and... They found, oh, uh, no trace whatsoever of any nerve agent at all at the scene. They did find markers of chlorine and very common chemical and explosives. So they can continue to hang on to that narrative that Assad, on the verge of clearing out the opposition from a densely populated area that include this right neighboring abutting the Syrian government held areas, but was for some reason dropping chemical chlorine bombs on his on his own people like that, because that's the best way to win that type of warfare, isn't it? Why? Don't ask why. Oh, actually, you can ask why, and I did talk about that in Why is Assad an Insane Suicidal Monster uh, in a previous Propaganda Watch, but that was the story, and they're sticking to it. By the way, that interim report from the OPCW. They need more time to do more investigation, but this is their interim report in the meantime that was issued last June. Uh, once again, if they followed up on that report with anything else, I certainly haven't seen it and I can't find it. So if anyone out there can see the follow-up to that report out there online, please let me know. I'll include it in the show notes so we can take a look at it. But as far as I know, all they ever did was issue an interim report showing, oh yeah, there was no nerve agent. Oh yeah, it might have been chlorine or something, but no, I, I don't know. Uh, or maybe, as was reported immediately after the incident by Robert Fisk, maybe it wasn't a chemical attack at all. Maybe these people were suffering from hypoxia. I've just been in the town of Duma. I found the clinic where the 
film of the children uh, stopping at the mouth and having water thrown at them was made. But the senior hospital doctor, who actually spoke very good English, um, who was there, told me that the video is, is real, that they were not suffering from gas poisoning, but <laughs> suffering from panic and hypoxia, as he put it, because of the amount of dust in the tunnels in which they live. All through the year, people in the Duma area have been living beneath their own homes in tunnels and basements. And that night, there was a lot of churn by the Syrian army and by the Russian Air Force. Um, and it produced a huge amount of dust and like, debris in the streets. And many people were finding it difficult to breathe. And when they reached the clinic, according to the doctor, um, someone shouted gas and they panicked. Um, but he did confirm that the film, the videotape, was indeed taken in the clinic there, the same clinic that I actually interviewed him in. Now, if people want to know more about Robert Fisk and his report on what he found in Duma when he went to visit there just a week after this incident did or did not occur, you can read about that in The Search for Truth in the Rubble of Duma and One Doctor's Doubts over the Chemical Attack, which, to its credit, The Independent did publish at independent.co.uk and was seemingly uh, was bolstered by that OPCW report. No nerve agent whatsoever found at the scene. Um... Anyway, uh, there's a lot more detail to all of this, so once again, I will invite you to go to the show notes. But once again, we see the same liars lying, lining up to repeat whatever lie comes from the mouth of the president, you know, as long as it's the right kind of lie. I mean, that's fake news that everyone can get behind, right? And by everyone, I mean, you know, everyone that matters. You know, governments and MSM and intelligence agencies. Those are the people that matter. Not you, right? Wrong. We very much do matter in all of this. It does matter. When they are liars and they are exposed as lying, it is important to remember that, to dishonor that, to publicly shame these liars for their fake news. Because it is important. It is important to have an accurate historical record. And it is important to know that what information we put into our brains certainly is important. It does make a difference in this world. And we can make a difference by pointing out the fake news when it comes and and shining a light on the truth uh, when it comes along too. Okay, there's very much more that can and should be said, but I will once again direct you to the announcement video for this video where you can see in the comment section at CorbettReport.com many, many, many suggestions for fake news story of 2018. Once again, all of the people that were mentioned uh, particularly with regards to all of these different stories will be uh, sent a corporate report DVD of their choosing, and I'll be in touch with them shortly, including on that Syria chemical weapons attack story. Again, many people were suggesting that in the comments, but the chronologically first was AM1618, so M1618 will also be receiving a corporate report DVD. So membership does have its privileges uh, from time to time. There is a reason to be a Corbett Report member other than to support the alternative media. And I think that's a pretty good reason right then and there. And one dollar a month does seem a reasonable price. But again, there are things like this where you can contribute and uh, maybe even win a DVD um, by contributing. So I do appreciate that. And for those out there in the crowd who don't know, yes, there are there is Corbett Report membership and you can become a member of the site which not only does make this website literally possible, but also enables you to comment on the site and uh, to uh, access the subscriber newsletter, which (laughs) I'm pretty sure some subscribers don't even know exists or aren't sure how to access it. It's pretty simple. Usually the, the latest newsletter is right there on the front page under featured article, or you can go up to the tab under articles, click newsletter, and there it'll be. Uh, You can access all of the past issues, and once a month there is a subscriber-only video, including this month. Uh, I am about to be releasing this month's subscriber newsletter, and it will contain this month's uh, subscriber video, which will be a little slice of life from here in Japan. So if you're interested in that, you can access it through the newsletter. You'll have to be logged in if you are a Corbett Report member. If you're not, please consider becoming one, corbettreport.com slash members. Uh, Again, as little as one dollar a month really does make this work possible. A big thank you to everyone who contributed to this award ceremony and thank you to our corporate sponsors and to those fine medical folks who distributed the flu shots tonight. It was it was a lot of fun. But seriously, folks, thank you as always for your support. I am James Corbett of CorbettReport.com. Looking forward to talking to you again very soon. <laughs>